Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for our COVID-19 two-year media update. Can't believe it has been two years since the start of the pandemic. Um, we're joined today by Medical Director of Infectious Disease and Perfection, uh, Prevention, Dr. Nick Gilpin. Um, thanks, Dr. Gilpin, for joining us today. Um, I want to start off just asking you a couple quick questions, and then we'll open it up to the media. First question is, what, what do you remember um, about this day two years ago? So I remember that we had our first We did recording have, in progress slow often took several days we also really didn't have any useful treatments um, certainly nothing like what we have available to us today and i remember the struggles that we had with with ppe i, uh, I remember collaborating um, with our supply chain team and working day and night to try to secure masks and gowns for our staff to try to help keep them safe so really what i remember about that two years ago is it was really like trying to slow down this runaway train or you know, to use the parlance of the times, flatten the curve, um, but it was also about really trying to protect our limited resources as much as we could. What, um, what are you most proud of regarding the pandemic response at Beaumont? Well, I'm really proud of what our teams have accomplished. Um, and, and we really did our best to get in front of this uh, as much as possible to get the word out to the community um, and we adapted very well to what was a, a, a difficult situation. Remember, that was the, the words that kept being said around that time. You know, these are difficult times. These are unprecedented times. You know, it really was all of those things. Um, early on, there were certainly times that this did feel like an existential crisis for our healthcare system. Questions like, are we going to get through this? Um, is this going to cripple us permanently as a healthcare system? But our teams showed up and they did their jobs and they did what they needed to do. Um, everybody was really pulling in the same direction, um, laser focused on this common goal of making sure that we're taking good care of patients, but also making sure that we're taking care of each other and keeping each other safe. Um, I think a lot of us during that time remembered our mission um, and what pushed us into healthcare in the first place. Um, and we were definitely running toward the fight rather than running away from it because, you know, because we had a job to do. All right. Um, what lessons did you learn or did all of us learn in healthcare over the past two years that you think have changed healthcare forever? Um, how have we improved and what will we take away from this? Well, I, I can't overstate this idea of what we can accomplish when we work together. And I know that sounds like a, <laughs> like, like sort of corporate, uh, corporate speak. Um, but I really do believe that, and I think the perfect example is this concept of telemedicine. Um, that was, that's probably the most widely referenced silver lining of the pandemic from a healthcare delivery standpoint. Um, you know, just being frank with you, there's no way that telemedicine would be as widely available today as it is if not for COVID. Um, it, it really jump-started that whole process of being able to, to implement this rapidly. I also, um, I also point to our ability to rapidly organize and deploy these huge set pieces. Um, thinking about things like our vaccine clinics, our, our curbside testing and triage, our monoclonal antibody centers, you know, those were big infrastructure uh, uh, things um, and those are examples of huge structural changes that ordinarily would take a lot of time and a lot of teeth gnashing for us to be able to do those things quickly. We were able to move those mountains really fast. And where, where do we stand today? I think a lot of people are wondering, is the pandemic over? Is the pandemic over? I think depends on who you ask. Uh, my answer to that question is no. Uh, and let's just look at this you know, from, from a data perspective. So worldwide, we're approaching about a half a billion cases of COVID that we know of. 
Um, in the United States, that number is around 80 million, and we're still having more than 40,000 new cases per day. Fortunately, cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, the, the big three in terms of metrics, are all trending down across the United States and across the world. In Michigan, um, we're currently enjoying very low case numbers in our state, and we're enjoying low test positivity numbers in most of the state, but we're still seeing around 1,000 new cases per day. At Beaumont, uh, we currently have fewer than 90 COVID patients in our eight hospital system. Um, just for perspective, we have not touched numbers that low since August of 2021. So it's been you know, a good seven months since we've been um, where we are right now in terms of numbers. All that is to say, um, we're currently in this post-Omicron recovery and we're moving into what I'll call a, a sort of a quiescent phase and this is a nice break for us as healthcare providers. This is a nice break for the community as well. But as long as there continue to be pockets of unvaccinated, unprotected people around the world um, in, in, uh, in, in countries that don't have as much in terms of resources as we have, then there's this opportunity for new clusters of cases to occur. And obviously that means the potential for new variants to occur. So, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. We just got to keep our foot on the gas and we got to stay laser focused to try to prevent that next thing from happening. All right. Is there anything else that you think people need to know as we move forward and kind of try to move into some more uncharted territory? So I'm, I'm telling people right now that this is a good time to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Um, I'm, in, I'm using this time, this sort of quiet time to um, fortify our position in terms of resources, to start prepping for whatever may come next, making sure we're stocked up on tests, making sure that we've got masks, cleaning supplies, all the things that we need to survive another surge. Um, this is also a really good time, I think, for us to hit the recruiting trail hard and start filling some open positions within our healthcare system. Um, a lot of people in the last couple of years have left healthcare um, some have left due to attrition. Uh, they, it was just, you know, it was time for them to be done and they, they decided to retire. Some have been uh, lost due to cost cutting measures um, and some have left due to burnout. Um, and, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. What we've been doing for the last couple of years has been incredibly difficult. Healthcare is a hard job. And this last two years has really um, has shown that in spades. But it's also an incredibly rewarding job. And if we want to continue to provide the best care for our communities, we're going to definitely need the bodies to do it. So I, I would like to use this as a time um, to try to improve our staffing situation as much as possible. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilpin. Um, we're going to open it up now to questions. So if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand and we'll go from there. Um, I don't know how to raise my hand on the screen, so okay. I'll just raise Go it ahead. here. I, I have uh, two, Mark, uh, if I could. Uh, doctor, can you talk at all about the numbers that the Beaumont system has had, cases and deaths? Over two years? Yeah. Or, or what we're seeing currently? Over two years. Oh, geez. Um, you know what? I, I should You can ballpark it. Yeah, I should have come prepared with that, Brad. I apologize. Mark, could we get those numbers? I, yeah. I have them in front of me right now. Yeah, if we can get Mark, them. if somebody, you or Tammy could just email me, that would that would be great. And my other question, you mentioned burnout. My brother um, died at Gross Point, Beaumont Gross Point back in September. And the, the medical staff there, the nurses and the doctors were amazing. But they were all talking about being very tired. How hard has it been in terms of staff morale, burnout, that kind of thing? You know, well, first off, I'm, I'm really sorry for your loss, Brad. That's, Thank that's you. tough. Um, you know, and, and to your question, I think it, it's just so hard to do this day in and day out. And I think we felt this particularly in the last surge, the last wave that we that hit us. After doing this for almost two years, each time we we make it through a surge, there's there's a hope that this is going to be the last one, right, and better days ahead. And so each new wave or new surge brings an element of sort of crushing defeat for our teams. And even though we're good at what we do, even though we show up day in and day out, 
you know, I got to tell you, a lot of people don't like to do this right now. They don't like to put the mask on and put the PPE on every single day for 12 hours a day. It is hard. Um, and, and, you know, that's been some of the big fallout from COVID in general is really trying to make sure that our teams not only have what they need to do their jobs, but also to make sure that they have the support for their mental health and well being. So, Beaumont and other healthcare systems have really gone all in on trying to make sure that our staff have those, have access to those resources for themselves so they can make sure that they're not only physically equipped to do their job, but also mentally equipped to do their job. Well, for what it's worth, the, the staff at Gross Point was amazing. So I want to thank them. Glad to hear that. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Danielle. Hi, thanks for talking to us. Um, I have a kind of a question related to the future. I was I was looking, um, and I'm sorry, Brad, to hear about your brother. That's unfortunately, I think a lot of people have these stories now. Yeah, thank you. Um, I. I um I was looking at I do an update every week every three times a week when the state updates their numbers, and I noticed yesterday um, that Washtenaw County and Macomb County showed up on our like the we do a list of the counties that have had the most new cases since in the last couple of days per capita, mm -hmm. and that concerned me a little bit because um with Omicron we saw the first the, the cases started to creep up first in the most populous counties in the state. And I know there's been some news of this, this BA2 surging. I don't know, does that, I just wonder if that, it, it's like it's like things are good now and everything seems hopeful, but are we just waiting for the next thing? <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, like I said, I think it depends who you ask. I think if you ask me or if you ask someone that works in public health, I think you'll get a, you'll get a different perspective. I think that we are concerned that there's gonna be the next thing, right? There are, you know, this is a target rich environment for a virus, right? There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that have either never been vaccinated or never had COVID, which is hard to believe, but it's true. And all those people are opportunities for the virus to infect, to reassort itself in some way, to make new copies of itself and to, to try to make itself more contagious and perhaps more deadly. You know, as we move from pandemic to endemic, which which is a you know a term that I don't love right now, because I think it sends a little bit of the wrong message. You know, endemic does not necessarily mean good, right? We we all I hope we all know that at this point. Um, but we have to recognize that if this virus is going to mutate again, if it's going to make a new variant, a new version of itself, it will be more contagious. It will have to be more contagious in order to outpace what came before it. So in this case, Omicron or BA2, whatever comes next will have to be more contagious than that. It does not mean that it necessarily has to be less deadly. You know, it, it could, for all intents and purposes, be more transmissible and capable of causing more severe disease, which would really be a terrible situation. And none of us are rooting for that to happen. But, you know, we'd be foolish not to at least be mindful of that possibility and make sure that we're preparing in such a way that we have the tools and the resources should that happen. I, I mean, are you concerned at all about that subvariant? Uh, not so much because it doesn't seem to be getting a, a very strong foothold against Omicron, probably because it's very closely related to Omicron. And, you know, a lot of people had Omicron in, in January and February. And, and so all of those people that, that had Omicron even if you had relatively mild disease, you are going to have some protection. So are you potentially vulnerable to get BA2? Yes. Are you gonna get so sick that you're gonna end up in the hospital? Statistically unlikely. Um, so I, I just don't think BA2 is quite different enough to be a game changer at this point. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Danielle. Uh, April. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm just curious, how um, is healthcare feeling about all the unmasking? Um, I just know, I know with, in my kids' school, um, a week after they said masks can be recommended but not required, all of a sudden we have an outbreak. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, as healthcare staff, are they feeling anxious about this or how are you all feeling? 
I think the answer, April, is yeah. I think a lot of us do feel a little nervous about the unmasking. I, I you know, I want to look at this from a couple of different perspectives. So psychologically, I get it. People do need a break um, from from the masks, and and I and we want people to be able to have that break when the cases get low enough, right? I mean, when we get to a point where there's very low community transmission. And the, the risk in the communities is sufficiently low enough that we can take the masks off and not run the risk of getting COVID, I think that's fine. When a lot of those mask mandates were getting lifted, we were still in a place where community transmission was hovering between five and 10% in our counties. That's still a lot of COVID for, for my taste. Now, as I think about what Beaumont's gonna do, more than likely in the next week or so, barring any changes, we'll probably start to shift away from masks in the so-called non-clinical areas. So for example, in an area like an administrative building or a, something that's not connected to one of our healthcare campuses, we will allow people to not wear masks or, or masking will be optional in those circumstances if people choose to not wear a mask. And I feel safe about that because we will have gotten to a point where community transmission is low enough to do that. But then if community transmission goes back up again, and if we start to find ourselves in a five to 10% transmission, or if we start to find ourselves having more hospitalizations related to COVID, we'll have to go back and say, all right, time to put those masks on again. And I think that's kind of what the world is gonna look like for a little while, this doing this kind of back and forth dance between masking and no masking. Thank you. Um, anyone else have questions for Dr. Gilpin? Oh, Danielle, you have another question. <laughs> if if nobody's going to ask one, I will. I will. Go for it. <laughs> um, I, I you, you addressed this a little bit, but I, when you were talking about telemedicine and thing, I mean, I mean, do you think? I mean, do you think? And maybe this is an obvious question, but I mean, it seems like this has fundamentally changed just everything about healthcare in some ways. I mean, do you think that's true? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think when you know, there are certain elements of this that are going to be with us to stay for a very long time. I think telemedicine is a perfect example, right? We're, we're never going to go back, right? We're never going to take that tool out of our toolkit because it's given us an opportunity to provide access to people who, for whatever reason, they don't want to physically go in to see their doctor or they can't, um, and, but they have a smartphone or they have a, a, a laptop and they can you know, access those resources without having to leave the house. That's a beautiful thing. Other things that I think might be with us to stay, I'm going to just throw out a bold prediction, but I think some element of masking in healthcare facilities is probably going to hang around for a while. Um, and I think that when you look at what's going on during respiratory virus season, like that critical period of time between say November and, and March, where we have you know, not only COVID risk, but we also have flu and we have other respiratory viruses, we might go back to masking in healthcare systems during that time. And that's something that we're very actively looking at. And that might be our, you know, I hate to say the, the corporate buzzword, new normal, but that's could be what it is going to be for us. And, I, and I'm fine with that. And we're just trying to figure out what that new world could look like. Thank you. Um, all right. Any other questions? Okay. Is there anything else that you'd like to, to add, Dr. Gilpin, before we wrap up? Just, um, just thank you, I think, to, to all of you that are on this and, and um, you know, for for, for attending these events and for listening and for getting the word out to the community. I, I really appreciate everything that you all do. So thank you.